Hey, welcome to the Intrepid Museum's new live virtual programming. And thank you for joining us. And we look forward to hearing your questions throughout the program. And I'll try to address as many of them as I can. The museum's uh, live streams are free. Uh, but if you would like to support us in the delivering this exciting content, uh, please click on the links below in the description. My name is Eric Bame. I'm the curator of aviation at the Intrepid Museum. I've been there 16 years, best job in the world. I'll be your host today. And today I'd like to talk about one of my airplanes. And that is the uh, AD Sky Raider. So uh, we're going to pop up a slide here so you know what I'm talking about. As you can see, I'm coming to you uh, because of COVID and this virtual stuff. I'm coming to you from my uh, my basement lair. Uh, that is, uh, I'm not on ship uh, working remotely. Uh, but as you can see in my basement workshop, I like to play with toy airplanes. Uh, but here we have our Sky Raider. And uh, to really start at the beginning with Sky Raider, uh, we got to go all the way back to the 1940s. So uh, we're going to pop up another slide here. And there you have the Grumman Avenger. Uh, we're going to talk about some World War II stuff because the Sky Raider really did, the genesis of the Sky Raider is from World War II. Um, you have the Avenger, and we're going to pop up another slide here, the SB2C Helldiver. So between the Avenger and the Helldiver, this is what really, uh, especially on Intrepid, brought the war in the Pacific to the Japanese. Uh, these airplanes were essential in the victory. Uh, the Avenger was a, classified as a torpedo bomber, but of course it could also serve in the dive bomber role. It was also outfitted, both airplanes actually were outfitted uh, with the capability carrying ground attack rockets as well. Uh, but you're looking at two airplanes that had, um, in the case of the Avenger, a three-man crew, in the case of the Hell Diver, a two-man crew, and the capability of uh, operating from aircraft carriers, but carrying about 2,000, maybe 2,200 pounds of ordnance. Uh, the Avenger could carry a 2,200-pound torpedo. Um, but the Navy, even during the war, wanted something better. They needed something faster. They needed something that can carry more. And so the design came down to, next slide, the new Dauntless II. So what you're looking at here is how uh, the uh, Sky Raider that is now on display at Intrepid, this is how it looked in 1945 when it was first built. And uh, they weren't called Sky Raiders yet. They were called the XBT-2D Dauntless II. Uh, and the X, that all means something. The X means experimental, B for bomber, T for torpedo, two for second type, D for Douglas. So it was very confusing. The Navy didn't get around to changing uh, their designation systems until uh, 1962 when it got more in line with what the Air Force was doing with uh, A for attack, F for fighter, B for bomber, and C for cargo, and so forth. Um, but the, here we have the Sky Raider prototypes in flight in 1945. Uh, what uh, upgrade? So now you're looking at an airplane instead of carrying 2,000 pounds of ordnance with two to three man crew, you're looking at an airplane with one guy, just the pilot and capabilities of up to 8,000 pounds of ordnance still operating from an aircraft carrier. So this is quite a remarkable thing. You can really kind of pin it all to that big old engine up front. And you can see that huge propeller in that photograph. Uh, let me get the next slide. Uh, another shot of the prototype from the other angle. You can see that big four blade prop on the front of that Pratt and Whitney 3350. That engine had close to 2,700 horsepower. That's a, more than 1,000 horsepower more than the engine in the, in the Avenger um, and, and the, the, uh, the Hell Diver as well. So that was really the secret to getting this airplane to carry so much stuff, still operate from a carrier, which is really cool is that if you look at the B-17 bomber of World War II, designed just several years before the Sky Raider, it had four engines and a 10-man crew and about the same bomb load. So here you're carrying something a little bit quicker, the same amount of weight, but most importantly for the Navy, you're able to operate this airplane from a carrier. Of course, it had the arresting hook you can see on the tail there and, and folding wings. Let me take up another slide here. Next slide, there it is. And that's what I'm talking about. There is the Sky Raider, one of the very early ones. Uh, we're looking at a photograph from the early 1950s. Intrepid wasn't online for the Korean War, but the Sky Raiders, too late for World War II. Their first flights were 1945 before the war ended, but too late to be built in mass and get out to the squadrons in time for combat. Uh, luckily, World War II ended before that was required, but boy, Korea came around in 1950, the Korean conflict, 
and Sky Raiders were ready to go. And just look at all the ordnance and fuel tanks hanging on that thing. Next slide. And here we go on uh, the carrier decks. And now you can see how we're all lined up. This is Intrepid. Uh, this is a photograph from our collection. That's the deck of Intrepid. Um, I could see several different squadrons there, also some A4s in the background. This probably is from 1966 or 1967, probably 66. Uh, showing Sky Raiders with the wings folded and are all the engines are running and are all taxiing forward to come up to the forward end of the flight deck to be launched on a, on a mission. Let me have another slide. Okay, here we see uh, a Sky Raider, uh, kind of a famous mission from, uh, uh, from Intrepid. And if you're an Intrepid fan, you definitely know the story of uh, the MiG shoot down by a Sky Raider. And I always like telling the story here, you have a World War II technology, uh, propeller driven reciprocating engine airplane with straight wings. This thing is not a fighter plane. This airplane is a ground attack airplane. It's not meant for air to air. But this squadron, VA-176 and pilot Tom Patton did manage to scrap with a MiG-17 jet during the Vietnam conflict. And uh, he got the better of the MiG. And I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Tom before he passed away and talking about uh, the mission. And he described how it all went down and just uh, a marvelous piece of airmanship on his part. But, uh, you know, to be in a ground attack airplane, uh, doing about 300 miles an hour, being, you know, chased by a jet that could do uh, probably close to twice that. Uh, but that jet got low and slow and low and slow is not good for that MiG. Uh, leave me another slide. And there's Tom Patton, um, and that's uh, Pete Russell, one of his uh, squadron mates. And you can see Pete's doing the thing that pilots always do. Whenever you talk to pilots, I love talking to these guys because when you talk about some kind of air maneuver or any kind of mission, first thing that happens is the hands come up and they start doing that. And that's what Pete's doing there with uh, with Tom and standing in front of their one of their Sky Raiders from their squadron with that distinctive B marking of VA-176. Um, next slide. So uh, I mentioned 8,000 pounds of ordnance on the Sky Raider, and what, a, what an amazing thing it could carry, not just a torpedo, not just a couple of bombs, but all sorts of bombs, rockets, gun pods. And you notice on the leading edge of the wing, you'll see the long barrels of 20 millimeter cannons. There's two on each side. Uh, so you, you're bringing all this power to bear. This particular airplane seems to have a, a large fuel tank in the center line. That gives him a little more range because he's going to use a lot of fuel hauling all that weight. But you're looking at some thousand pound bombs there and kind of a very unconventional bomb on that very last pylon. This is a photograph from the USS Midway back in 1965. Uh, they used to say that the uh, Sky Raider can deliver anything. And uh, that is actually uh, a toilet bowl. Uh, that the guys uh, tongue in cheek had to make special mounts to fit on there. Now this was really, really taking a chance. You don't know how this thing's going to act. Uh, Ordnance is tested very, very uh, fully before it is allowed to fly on an airplane in combat. But the guys rigged up this toilet bowl, and the the guys working on the flight deck had to kind of stand in front of the airplane to kind of block the view of the commander looking down from the island to make sure he didn't see that toilet bowl on there until the airplane was fully taxied forward and then launched for the mission. Uh, it was a little bit of trouble because that toilet bowl weighs a lot less than a bomb. So when he released it, it didn't fall away real cleanly. It almost came back up. Uh, because of its light weight, you think of a toilet bowl is pretty heavy, but nothing like a bomb. And especially in the slipstream of 300 miles an hour, it's uh, it's kind of dangerous. That toilet bowl wanted to come back up and smack him in the wing. So he's lucky he got away with that little prank. Give me another slide here. So the Sky Raider uh, wasn't just a ground attack airplane. It was really, really versatile. Uh, it was able to do a lot of things, and the airframe could be adapted to anything at all. And if you look at this one, the very pronounced on the bottom there, you'll see a very large radome. Now, some of the other things they did with the uh, Sky Raider is they, they modified it. They did have more crew members in the back. You could have up to four crew members in a Sky Raider with the enlarged cockpit. But those guys were all systems operators. Uh, some of them, like this airplane we're looking at here, this is the 5W version, the AD5W. Uh, were used for for searches, a big search radar in there. Um, they, were, they were also modified for electronic countermeasures. They could jam enemy radar so other bombers can get into the target. Uh, night operations. There was just a, a multitude of modifications that the this huge airframe was able to adapt to. Uh, let me give you another slide. 
So the Navy used these uh, in Vietnam, all through, well, early parts of Rolling Thunder from 65, 66 into almost 67. But the Navy started phasing the Sky Raider out, even though it was a wonderful bomber. It was still a 300 mile an hour airplane. It was a reciprocating engine. The Navy was kind of transitioning to an all jet attack program. They had the A-4 Skyhawk. You could see one of those at Intrepid. In fact, a Vietnam veteran from Intrepid uh, you can see on display. Uh, the A-6 Intruder was coming out, was going to be used quite heavily in the Vietnam conflict. Uh, so they were getting away from these reciprocating engines. And also, uh, it's it's older technology. Uh, the bombs used on this were you know, what they refer to today as like dumb bombs. Um, so this was the, the technology they wanted to phase out. But what you're looking at here, notice it's not gray like the Navy uh, Sky Raiders. This one's kind of green and tan. That's because the United States Air Force, also operating in Vietnam, when the Navy was turning in their Sky Raiders, the Air Force never operated the Sky Raiders off the assembly line. They never, they never got them brand new. They got them from the Navy. And the Air Force had some special needs in Vietnam, and that was close air support. Uh, some of the things they did in the close air support role uh, was be able to loiter for a long time, flying around with your horns until a, a, a troops on the ground needed you, and then they could call you in for a precision strike. Another thing that was very important was uh, combat rescue, uh, kind of flying around as the helicopters came in and hover over those jungles. They're very vulnerable when they lower their winch down into the jungle, maybe to pull a pilot out, rescue a pilot, they would call in the Sky Raiders to kind of circle around and kind of protect the area. So the, the Air Force had a whole lot more need for these airplanes. So those old airframes weren't just thrown away. The Air Force took them over. And there's actually two Air Force officers uh, won the Medal of Honor flying missions in um, in Sky Raiders. And uh, that, those are both kind of long stories. But can you imagine uh, when your buddy's being shot down and able to land an airplane? Uh, his name was Bernard Fisher. He actually landed his airplane and was able to help his buddy escape. Uh, so not a lot. Of, you can't do that with any jets. But the Sky Raider was able to get into a non-airfield condition and, and rescue somebody. So an amazing airplane. Uh, once the, um, the Vietnam War was ending for us, uh, those Sky Raiders were left behind. They were all turned over to the South Vietnamese Air Force. And many of them uh, served in the South Vietnamese Air Force until the conflict ended. Next slide. So we're going to fast forward to present day. And what you're looking at there is uh, one of the very, very first Sky Raider prototypes. There was only 20 prototypes made. This is one of them. Uh, this is an XBT2D-1 Dauntless II. And uh, this is actually the airplane that now lives on the Intrepid at the Intrepid Museum. The airplane was... Um, it's probably the oldest Sky Raider airframe still in one piece. There's several still flying with private collectors, believe it or not. Uh, but some of the older airframes have been completely destroyed or they're gone or are left in Vietnam. The prototypes are all gone. There's only two that I know of. This one and there's one in a junkyard that is uh, uh, in Ohio, in, in northeastern Ohio, uh, that is incomplete and missing a lot of parts. I'm not even sure they have the uh, outboard wing panels for it, but it's missing a lot of parts. So this is probably the oldest Sky Raider uh, in one piece. And here you see it just several years ago, uh, the way it appeared at Naval Air Station Oceana. Uh, it was being uh, not neglected, but they had a lot of airplanes in this airplane park, and some are easier to take care of than others. Uh, this airplane is kind of large with the long wings. Uh, the, the lawnmower guy kind of whacked it a few times. Uh, on the trailing edges of the wings and the tail. So it had a lot of damage on it. And this particular airplane was actually owned by the uh, United States Marine Corps Museum in Quantico, the National Museum of the, of the Marines. Our friends down there uh, gave us a call and said they had this airplane. I've been on a waiting list at this point for a decade, waiting for a Sky Raider to come available from either the Navy or the Marines. And here he had one. He says, that's oh, a bit of a basket case, but if you want it, it's yours. And I was, did not hesitate. I did not hesitate. And uh, with support from donors, uh, from our wonderful uh, board of trustees, and of course the uh, president of the museum, the vice presidents, we were able to make this work. And we brought this Sky Raider uh, to Intrepid. Let me show you the next slide. 
Oh, we got a question coming up. Uh, were Sky Raiders operated with steam catapults? Yes, there is. Uh, there is two points. Uh, I don't have a photograph of it, but there's two points under the right under the belly near the landing gear uh, that are hard points. They look like hooks, and it. You know, if you look at modern day movies uh, like like Top Gun or something, or even like you know the old Top Gun movie, uh, the F-14, they latch onto the nose gear and pull it off that way. Uh, back in the day, back in the 50s and 60s, you had to use a bridle. So it was a cable mechanism that would hook on either side of the airplane at the very strong points at the landing gear and come down to a central point and hook onto the uh, catapult uh, bogey. And then when it shot off, the uh, you could lose the, the harness forever. The bridle could go flying off into the water. But if you were real smart, you attached a little lanyard to it. And that lanyard would catch it when it released the airplane and you could retrieve it and reuse the cable. Uh, if you ever come out to visit Intrepid, you'll notice there's two things sticking off the flight deck, uh, two protuberances that kind of stick out like that. Inside there was the wheel mechanism to retrieve bridles. Okay, we're going to enlarge this picture again. Hey, there's another question here. What kind of ordnance did the Sky Raider hold? Every, I mentioned those 20 millimeter cannons, uh, all sorts of iron bombs, uh, air to ground rockets of different types, uh, gun pods, uh, torpedoes, mines. Mine, you can mine the harbor uh, if you wanted to. You, just anything that was in the uh, inventory at the time, uh, this airplane could carry. Uh, we're going to change the slide. So here we are, we, uh, we decided to get this airplane, but the big problem was it's uh, down in Virginia and we had to get it up to New York City. And so uh, the best way to do that was to take it apart. Uh, the thing with the Sky Raider, you could take the wings off where they fold, but the inboard wings where the landing gear are, are one piece with the center fuselage. And so the first thing we did is we took the engines off. So the engine came off quite cleanly, came off right where it's supposed to. It's just several bolts and some plumbing and some wiring, and that comes off quite easily. But we had to separate the fuselage after the cockpit and remove it. Let me see the next slide. Okay, here we are. We're, now we're in New York City putting it back together. But if you can kind of look, um, just after, if you look at the side of the fuselage, you'll see that there's a, a little motif of the squadron. Uh, there it looks like a lion riding on a bomb. Just after that, you'll see a black line. It looks like a letter L and then it gets crooked and goes down again. That was where the separation joint, where the fuselage had to be separated. And then the wheels were folded up so the wings could fit on a flatbed truck kind of parallel with the truck. You turn the fuselage sideways, engine off, air fuselage off, and that was the only way to fit it on the truck. Now, one of the things that was really crazy about this move is that uh, airplanes have sometimes things in the cockpit that have a little bit of radiation to them. Uh, usually it's in the instruments. Uh, sometimes the, the, the dials have a glow in the dark paint on them. There could be other things that have a little bit of radiation. It's not really dangerous stuff, but in this current age, that little bit of radiation can be collected by people who don't want to do well and put into a small bomb. And what it makes is kind of like a dirty bomb. It kind of spreads this low level radiation. So you don't want anybody getting a hold of this stuff. So the first thing you do with an old airplane is you do a radiation survey. And there was an instrument uh, in the airplane that was kind of glowing uh, with radioactivity, very low level, not dangerous for the pilot, really not dangerous to be around, not dangerous unless you eat it, to tell you the truth. But it would set off the sensors uh, that exist on all the ports of entry into New York City. New York City is an island. We have tunnels and we have bridges. And we had to bring this airplane and its big trucks over the George Washington Bridge and then bring it down uh, down the west side, down Broadway, believe it or not. Uh, but there's sensors up there to make sure that uh, no bad guys bring in any kind of radiation into New York City. It would have set the sensors off. So uh, we had to pay to have a radiation expert come out, find this low-level radiation uh, identify the instrument that uh, was causing the problem, have it removed, and have it disposed of properly. So we averted that little disaster. But uh, here it is on our pier being reassembled. And next slide. And then the next thing you do once you get it in one piece is you hook up the cranes and you bring her on onto the deck.
And it was a really wonderful day to see finally a Sky Ray returning to the flight deck of Intrepid. There had not been a Sky Ray on Intrepid or a Sky Raider on Intrepid probably 1971 or 72. So the first Sky Raider to see Intrepid's deck in a very long time. And there, there it is up in the sky. And that's, uh, that's essentially her last flight. Okay, so here we are. Uh, that's, that's yours truly on the left there. And with some of our volunteers and some of our staff. And we're cutting a ribbon with our aircraft sheet metal shears. And that was to open our new aircraft restoration facility just a few years ago. Uh, this was uh, an amazing time for us. We were working out of a tent for about 10 years uh, we had a, a very large tent, but uh, days like today, we're here in New York City, it's about 22 degrees out there, and it's cold. Uh, we would not be able to work in, in those kind of conditions. So now we have a real structure up there. Uh, once again, uh, thanks to our the, the wonderful board of uh, trustees that we have, the leadership at the ship, and of course, our many donors uh, to make this happen. And to see uh, the volunteers have them take part in welcoming this new building. Sky Raider was the very first airplane to go into the new building for restoration. Next slide. And that's, uh, that's Sky Raider rolling into the brand new fresh building. Now, if you go to see this building now, it's just full, chock full of equipment. Uh, we have to move all the equipment out of the way just to get airplanes in and out. We actually have two helicopters in this building uh, at the present time, our Sea Cobra and um, um, our H-19 are both in there getting repainted. They're almost done. Uh, they'll be ready in springtime when the museum reopens uh, the end of March. We're going to be ready to roll those helicopters out and put them back out on the line. So come out and see us and see our new helicopter paint jobs. Next slide. So uh, here we have a couple of folks. Uh, this is staff and volunteers uh, working on Sky Raider. Um, I think I have uh, a little video I can show you. Is that the next uh, next thing up? So watch this video, quite proud of it. I'm Eric Bain, I'm Curator of Aviation here at the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum. My name is Peter Taraka. I've been the manager of aircraft restoration here at Intrepid for seven years. The past couple of years, uh, I've been focusing on this machine behind me, the Sky Raider. It's taking up a lot of my energy. It took us two and a half years to uh, completely uh, finish this restoration. When I first arrived here, I looked at the airplane collection and noticed that there was airplanes that really didn't belong here and a few airplanes that are really super important to Intrepid history that were not here. Sky Raider was almost number one on my list of things to find. We acquired the Sky Raider back in 2014. The curator at the National Museum of the United States Marine Corps, Quantico, Virginia, calls me up and says, I got a Sky Raider for you, but, and the but was, it needs a lot of help. It's an older Sky Raider. I didn't know how old at the time, but they had one. It was in very poor shape. It was in neglected condition, sitting outside at Naval Air Station Oceana. And the thing was essentially an outside display in a park. And so the lawnmower guy uh, kind of had his way with it, but I just didn't care because we needed a Sky Raider and Sky Raiders are very hard to come by. So when one popped up, I really didn't care if it was coming in shovels and, and boxes full of parts. I wanted that Sky Raider and what we really got was a diamond in the rough. I accompanied the team that went down to Virginia to uh, disassemble the airplane and I was somewhat impressed with the good condition of the internal structure of the airplane. Outside of uh, much superficial damage on the, the exterior of the airplane, uh, the, the primary structure was still uh, intact. We had kind of developed a little reputation here of taking care of our stuff. Being in the New York City environment, it's just really harsh on airplanes and hanging out into salt water and things like that. So we had to come up with some techniques and some processes of our own. When a, a, an airplane arrives here at Intrepid that has been neglected as this one was, the first thing you have to do is just kind of look at every square inch of it. And that's inside and outside and assess what we're dealing with. How much metal do we need to replace? What needs to be rebuilt? Some of the first damage that we noticed uh, was on the trailing edges of the uh, elevators and on the flaps and on the ailerons. The cockpit has been gutted out and there is no canopies available for, for airplanes of this age. 
And we also have to look at historically what the airplane's appearance was uh, when it was flying. We replaced the uh, tail wheel. We fabricated a tail hook. We replaced many of the panels on the fuselage. One of the biggest jobs was uh, replacing the forward fuselage access panel, all three of which needed to be uh, fabricated. Uh, we did remove about 200 pounds of bird nesting material out of the engine cowling, but uh, the end result uh, makes for a not just a beautiful product, but a product that is properly sealed against the elements. And here we are. Now it's received that help and it's ready to roll out. We save everything we cut off the airplane, the original fabric of the airplane. It's the original thing, and you don't want to just throw that in the trash. And so we do down below deck in our storage area, we have boxes and boxes of airplane parts that are completely unusable, corrosion and rotted away and bad, uh, but we save every bit of every airplane that we remove a part from. Without a doubt, my favorite repair was that forward fuselage access panel. I learned a lot about shaping the metal, new processes, trying it a couple of times and then saying, no, let me start over because that's not right. The work we do here, I have to look at that through different lenses. The first lens is the preservation of the object. It's a historical object and it needs to be preserved, yet we're in a very hostile environment. The second way to look at it is what are the visitors going to learn from it? This is actually now a teaching tool the education department, tour guides and such will now use this airplane to tell intrepid stories, to tell Sky Raider stories. And then there's maybe even the most important part is preserving the legacy of the men that flew it and the men that maintained it. And then it all kind of rolls in together. All those things play off each other. Intrepid served three tours of duty in Vietnam. All three of those, there were uh, squadrons of Sky Raiders on board. Various parts of the ship contained spare parts for all the airplanes that would be serving on the ship. I'm not sure who it was. Was roaming around and found a pristine new old stock tail wheel for a Sky Raider. And we acquire a Sky Raider that is badly in need of a tail wheel. And boom, we have, we have one right there, ready to go. This is probably one of the oldest Sky Raiders still in one piece. And it's really not uh, originally built as a Sky Raider. This was built as an XBT 2D Dauntless II. This is one of the prototypes. So when we consider this airplane, should we paint it up to represent one of the many, many Sky Raider squadrons that served on Intrepid? And when we considered that this airplane is one of the prototypes, the oldest Sky Raider still in one piece, the only way to really refinish it and display it is in its original rollout markings. We are also familiar with uh, what is required integrity wise for airplanes to live out here on the flight deck day in day out exposed to high winds storms blizzards both structurally and apparently what am i most proud of well you know uh, i'm proud of the team that's in here this project would uh, would never have uh, reached this level of completion in this time window without uh copious reinforcements. Most of the effort that went into this restoration was done by women. And this seems really appropriate to me because back in 1945, when this airplane was first built, uh, women were the workforce in, in most of the aircraft factories in this country. So taking on a project like this is not cheap and what has been really really important is our institutional advancement department they have been absolutely essential in finding those people who care about this airplane and it's not necessarily the pilots or the ground crew or or the you know the men who flew it it's uh even their families and there's uh, some great stories of some families involved that want to honor dad or grandpa and uh, his connection to this airplane. And those people have stepped up. It's a bittersweet moment, but it'll be great to see it out on the flight line. As, as wonderful as this project is and uh, as happy as we are to uh, have a Sky Raider on Intrepid, there are a number of airplanes in the collection that are ripe for uh, 
some TLC. Next up are two of Intrepid's helicopters, the Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw and the Bell AH-1 Super Cobra. Well, the wish list still has some things on the list. The uh, F6F Hellcat, an F4U uh, Corsair are right on the top of the list. Uh, those things are gonna be very hard to get. They're even more rare than Sky Raider. So finally getting a Sky Raider on display on the deck is not the end of the story. It's just a story. And uh, it's great to have it here. It fills that void for us, but there's more to tell. There's other airplanes and helicopters to uh, acquire and to keep telling those stories. So uh, here at Intrepid, it never ends. Part where Peter talks about our staff, we have a lot of volunteers and staff that are women who work on the airplane, and that's uh, not on purpose. It's just that they were qualified and they were available and they were put to work. And uh, he mentions um, how it was women that built these things, and here they are fixing them. So I think you know, that's just a great part of the story. Hey, there was a question a little earlier on that didn't pop up uh, from Tom Fisher: uh, Are there significant differences between our Sky Raider and final models? And uh, yeah. No, there's not, not significantly any difference. It's quite amazing in the airplane world to have the prototypes uh, kind of move on into production with very little update. There were some changes in the landing gear door, uh, the speed brake uh, mechanism, but uh, not that you would notice. Externally, you wouldn't notice very many changes at all other, until you get into the modified Sky Raiders. Um, uh, what is the most modern aircraft in Intrepid's collection? And when did it fly? Great question. The most uh, recent, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'd have to say most recent one would be uh, our F-16. Uh, the F-16 Fighting Falcon, it's an Air Force F-16 that actually flew in Desert Storm. It was attached to the uh, New York State Air National Guard uh, up in um, Syracuse. And uh, they were deployed for the Gulf War and actually saw combat on the very first night of Desert Storm, and that airplane flew over Baghdad. I got to meet the pilot. We had him down uh, at the ship. He lives in upstate New York still, and uh, we brought him down uh, to do a little talk. So uh, that's, like I, I mentioned in the video, um, you know, we, we do try to preserve these objects, but once you get the objects preserved, you got to find the people that built them, designed them, flew them, maintained them. Anybody who might have touched that thing, their stories are the best part. And so we're still looking for those. Um, we got another question here. What is the fastest aircraft on a trip? That's easy. That's our, our A-12 from Project Oxcart. It looks a lot like an SR-71. Some of you may know the difference between an A-12 and an SR-71, mainly uh, its instrumentation. And the A-12 was a single seater. Uh, the SR-71 needed a guy in the back to operate all the advanced equipment that that airplane was able to carry. The A-12 was actually a little bit faster than the SR-71. But uh, a lot of people call it the Blackbird. The Blackbird uh, nickname kind of refers to the SR-71s, the A-12s. Uh, if you ever talk to an A-12 pilot, I've never met one that called it the Blackbird. They always called it Oxcart or um, uh, the Signet was another uh, name that the, those guys, the in-crowd calls it. Uh, let's see, any more questions here? Let's scroll through real quick. Uh, somebody asked, do you guys have one Sky Raider in your aircraft collection? That's from Elsa. Uh, yeah, we only have the one. It uh, took a long time to get that one. If I got another, boy, I hope it would be the proper model and type uh, to do the Tom Patton story. It depends. Uh, that's something I call uh, curatorial decisions when we decide how we're going to paint an airplane. Um, sometimes an airplane does not have itself a significant story in that airframe. For instance, our F-8 Crusader uh, never deployed in a combat situation. It was used in flight tests. Uh, it was used in 
testing weapons and how missiles are released from it and things like that. Uh, so, you know, an interesting story, but not a combat story. But then we had a really great combat story of an F-8 from Intrepid. And, of course, that's Tony Nargi's uh, shoot down of a MiG-21. So the F-8 is painted as Tony Nargi's MiG or uh, F-8 from that day in, in 1968. So, uh, but sometimes you get an airplane like Sky Raider uh, that has an interesting story of its own and you just got to paint it that way. Another one uh, that's like that is our, the Blue Angel. The F-11F Tiger was Blue Angel number five from 60 to 63. And uh, there's no other way to paint it. It has to be painted as Blue Angel because that's what it really was. Oh, I got a question here from Michael Murtaugh, good old friend, Michael Murtaugh. We miss you, buddy. Uh, uh, all the pilots you have met who flew aircraft at the Intrepid Museum, which one was the most exciting to meet? Wow. That, um, that's a really hard question because uh, I work with the oral history program. I've interviewed a lot of pilots. Uh, I've met, I've met, like I said, the A-12 pilot. I've met at the F-16 pilot. I've met the pilot who flew our Blue Angel. I've met the pilot that flew uh, our A-4 Skyhawk. Um, I know a pilot who flew the Fury. Uh, my dad uh, was a gunner on Avengers. Uh, but we get when you talk about pilots, one that I'm not going to say exciting. I'm going to say the one that moved me the most. Uh, two guys. They're two guys that are down in Florida. They're both uh, well retired. Uh, both of them uh, were A4 Sky Raider pilot or Skyhawk pilots, and both were shot down over Vietnam and spent very long periods of their life as POWs. And I got to interview those both of those guys for uh, the oral history program, Pete Stoffel and Danny Key. And uh, to have these gentlemen talk about their experiences in combat, getting shot down, being captured, and ending up in the Hanoi Hilton and moved around in different prison camps and surviving that uh, is just amazing. And our oral history program, uh, some of these things will pop up online as we move towards getting our collection accessible online, both uh, Objects and stories uh, eventually will all be online uh, for you guys to enjoy. Are there any new aircraft you hope to get in the future? Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, As mentioned in the film, I would love to have a Hellcat. I would love to have a Corsair, F4U Corsair. These airplanes are very hard. They're very rare. Uh, they're hard to get. In the case of the Corsair, there's quite a few Corsairs in private hands out there. The thing is, I don't think you can touch one for a few million dollars and you're going to get it in boxes and buckets of parts. Uh, they're very expensive uh, because there's so much in demand in the, the Warbird collector market. So it's very hard to get those two airplanes. There's another airplane that's really rare, and that is the Helldiver that I mentioned in the beginning of this little presentation. Uh, the SB2C Helldiver, uh, there's, I don't know, maybe I'd have to look it up, but maybe eight or nine, 10,000 of those things built for the war effort. There are four in one piece in the world today. Uh, one of them is at the Smithsonian. One of them is flying with the commemorative Air, Flo Air Force. Um, one is in a museum in Thailand uh, because uh, the French and their Indochina wars, we kind of supplied those in the 50s. Uh, so they left a hell diver behind there. And there is one in the Greek Air Force Museum. Uh, so that is a four. I know there's a couple of other partial uh, hell divers out there that are being put back together by private individuals, uh, but they must have some really deep pockets because that's uh, you're going to have to build parts for that airplane that just don't exist anymore. But hopefully they get those projects done and we get to see more hell divers in the world. Let me scroll down and see if there are any more questions. Uh, Andy Ernst, you're asking, hi, Eric, is there any need for volunteers at Intrepid? Yes. Uh, yeah, I filled one from years ago, but never heard anything. Well, that's, that's a shame. Uh, if it was several years ago, we were probably going through a transition in our volunteer program uh, where we had some personnel moving around and maybe you got lost in the shuffle. Um, yeah, with the experience you have, uh, uh, Andy's saying that he is a uh, U.S. Navy served on CB-43 attached to F-4 and A-6 aircraft. Uh, on separate cruises. Yeah, yeah, we could use some airplane experience. Yes, there's room for volunteers at all time. Of course, we're in the middle of COVID. The museum is closed right now. We'll be reopening the end of March. Uh, hopefully, everybody gets their vaccination and uh, things start getting back to normal this summer. I mean, we can't even do a fleet week this year. Uh, hopefully, we're going to do something virtual uh, around fleet week, something a little 
hopefully exciting um, to kind of share the experience that uh, we're not going to get in person. But uh, volunteers are always welcome. And there's lots of things for volunteers to do at Intrepid uh, as ex explainers. Um, you'll learn about uh, the missions of, of the Intrepid and you can tell stories, you can give tours. And of course, you can, uh, if, you have, if you have the skills, uh, we'd love to have you work on airplanes. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Okay, I want to know, yeah, any more questions here? Oh, how is the plane from Erzurum that is named after a lion club? That's from, am I saying your name right? Uh, Beji Flammenbaum? Uh, yeah, you're talking about the kefir. Yeah, the, the kefir was repainted uh, about two years ago, I want to say, and it's beautiful. Uh, we, we experimented with some new techniques with our paint on that airplane and it's holding up amazing. Uh, the outdoor environment just destroys our finishes at Intrepid. And it seems like we have to kind of roll them in every five, six, seven years to get repainted. Uh, we repainted the uh, the kefir, the Israeli kefir uh, a couple of years ago and boy, it's holding up so good. It's not showing any deterioration at all. So I hope we get a few more years at it. So it's doing great. Um, I, I said that. So, uh, okay, you're, you're saying I said your name right. Good. I hope so. Uh, from Daddy Marks, uh, do you have a favorite aircraft? Yeah, all the ones with wings or rotors on them. <laughs> I love them all. They're all like my children. You know, I mentioned very briefly that my dad was a gunner on TBM Avengers. So, um, as you notice, I'm, because of COVID, I'm sitting in my basement workshop instead of going to the ship every day, which kind of breaks my heart. Uh, but every day when I go to work, I walk past the Avenger and I can see my daddy sitting on the wing. So that uh, kind of makes that my favorite airplane because I think of my dad every day just by looking at the airplane that he went to war in when he was only 17 years old. Um uh, what's the largest aircraft on Intrepid? The largest, this is another question from Elsa. The largest aircraft from Intrepid is not on the flight deck and it's out on the pier. And that, of course, is our British Airways Concorde. And it's huge. It's an airliner. Um, it's a supersonic airliner. If you uh, know anything about Concords, you know they're just the most beautiful airplane that ever was. The shape of this airplane, uh, it's, it's, it's a function of the speed it has to go, the shape of the thing. Uh, but... Uh, uh, form follows function or the other way around. I, I don't know the saying, but boy, that airplane is beautiful, but it has to be shaped the way it is to do what it does. Um, but it's really tiny inside. It's an airliner, carries a hundred passengers, uh, but I am six foot three. And when I get in there, I'm kind of hunched down because my head will hit the ceiling. Uh, there's just one aisle way, uh, two rows of seats on each side of the aisle way, hundred passengers. It's kind of like a really big private jet. And that's kind of the way they operated at British Airways. Everything was special about it. Everything from the, um, you know, the the terminals in London and in New York and in other destinations. Those were just amazing places. And to the food and the champagne and the wine that you got on board, everything was first class. There was no classes on on uh, Concorde. There's no first class and 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 steerage class. There was none of that going on. It was one class and it was Concorde class and it was excellent. Okay. Uh, any more questions coming up? Doesn't look like there is. Uh, we're coming up on about 44 minutes on here. We wanted to shoot for 45. Uh, I, I kept your time long enough. I hope I kept your attention. I hope you're excited about what we're doing at Intrepid. Um, yeah, the comments are coming up. Wish they bring back the SSTs. Yeah. Yeah. I wish they would too. I would love to get to Europe quick <laughs> rather than six hours. Um, so I'm gonna gonna sign off here. Um, thank you for watching and sharing your questions and your comments. Uh, keep them rolling in, and I can answer them via email later on if you want. Uh, the music, the museum uh, has introduced a number of new live streams. Uh, please follow and subscribe to this channel, or visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. And we're new to Twitch, so and we love being here. And we're gonna do as as many of these things as we can and try to make them exciting. We need to know what you want to know about. Uh, links are below uh, in the description. If you're able, your donation of any amount would keep programs like uh, fixing our airplanes uh, free and or you know keep those things robust. But you're also these programs, these virtual programs, can be free or low cost. Uh, explore, become a member online. Uh, 
come see us at Intrepid when we reopen. Uh, enjoy us online. Enjoy us virtually. We've got Kids Week next week. So if you got kids at home, uh, check our website out, intrepidmuseum.org. Uh, look for Kids Week. And uh, Kids Week is going to be a lot of fun next week. I'll be your host on a couple of those days. Uh, so come see us next week. Uh, so I'm going to be signing off. Thank you. <laughs>